Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to friends joining us from around the world on this very special HSS Insight series, which will be delivered by Professor Mahmoud Mamdani. He's joining us from Columbia University, New York, and today he will be talking to us about his book, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. So I will just give a brief abstract and a speaker bio note. Um, this lecture will offer a genealogy of political modernity. The nation state and the colonial state were constructed at the same time through the politicization of a religious or ethnic majority at the expense of an equally manufactured minority. This lecture will provide a historical analysis starting with the colonization of North America and concluding with the anti-apartheid struggle. An unfinished pursuit of a state without a nation. What lessons does the anti-apartheid struggle offer for the contemporary world? Now, let me introduce our esteemed speaker. Professor Mahmoud Damdani is the Herbert Lemon Professor of Government and Professor of Anthropology, Political Science, and of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University. He received his PhD from Harvard University in 1974 and specializes in the study of colonial and post-colonial violence. His work explores the intersection between politics and culture, a comparative study of colonialism since 1452, the history of civil war and genocide in Africa, the Cold War and the War on Terror, the history and theory of human rights and the politics of knowledge production. Professor Mamdani was the director of the Makare Institute of Social Research in Kampala from 2010 till 2022, where he inaugurated a multidisciplinary doctorate in social studies. Prior to joining the Columbia faculty, Professor Mamdani was a professor at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania from 1973 to 1979, Makere University in Uganda from 1980 to 1993, and the University of Cape Town from 1996 to 1999. Some of Professor Mamdani's books include his most recent Neither Settler Nor Native, the Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities, which, which was published in 2020, which was among the four finalists for the British Academy Award, which recognizes work that searches for truth and reason in difficult places and shines a light on connections and divisions that shape cultural identity worldwide. His earlier book, Citizen and Subject, Contemporary Africa and the Legacy of Late Colonialism, which was published in 1996, was awarded the Herkowitz Prize by the African Studies Association. Professor Mamdani is also the author of Saviors and Survivors, Darfur Politics and the War on Terror, 2009, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim America, The Cold War and the Roots of Terror in 2004, and When Victims Become Killers, Colonialism, Nativism and Genocide in Rwanda, which was published in 2001. Uh, he has received numerous awards and recognitions, the most recent of which being listed in 2021 by Prospect Magazine UK as the fourth among the top 50 thinkers globally. Uh, with that introduction, I warmly welcome Professor Mamdani and I hand over the mic uh, to him to uh, deliver his session. Thank you so much. Um... We can go one of two ways. Uh, I have a prepared lecture, um, but also if you've had a chance to read the book, it may be boring to listen to a prepared lecture. We could reverse the agenda and begin with questions that you have. Um, the proviso is, that the questions should come from the book, uh, not, not from life, uh, because then you would expect me to talk about everything. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, so the idea is that because uh, we have, I mean, uh, 
there, there are some of us who have read the book, but uh, a lot of people who are join, joining might not have read the book. So what we can do is we can maybe have a brief presentation from your side, and then we can start off with questions from the book and then op open it up to the audience for their... Well, the presentation will be the presentation I have prepared according to your guidelines, which yes. were that I should prepare a 45-minute presentation. So if we go for the presentation, it'll be 45 minutes. Sure. And then, and then, and then questions by you. The book, by the way, is available in India. It's it's published in India. Also. Yes, we have the yes, we, the the book is with me. I have I've had the pleasure of reading the book. It's a it's a fantastic book, and I'm uh, so I'm looking forward for your for your discussion. Yeah, the reason I speak about the Indian edition is because unlike American editions, which are awfully expensive um, for someone on an Indian income, uh, the Indian edition is, I think, reasonably priced. Okay, so... Yes. Um, so I'm gonna weave this together by taking a historical look at a question of uh, great contemporary significance. Uh, what kind of government do we need? Um, and my answer is going to be based on my new book, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. Now, Neither Settler Nor Native is about the nation state and post-colonial modernity. The introduction opens with a history of the two phases of the nation state, the first non-liberal and the second liberal. The nation state, I argue, was born in Iberia, Spain in 1492. Its agenda was summed up by a single slogan, one country, one people, one religion. It defined the nation. This project set fire to relations between majority and minorities within the boundaries of the state, setting in motion processes of ethnic cleansing, specifically of Jews and Muslims. This was followed by a century of religious wars in Europe. I identify this as the first, the non-liberal phase in the making of the nation state. Non-liberal in the sense that there was no claim a, of minorities having any rights, um, minorities were subject to the will of the majority. The liberal solution to religious wars was the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Two key components of the modern state were born at Westphalia. Religious toleration at home and the reciprocal guarantee of sovereignty abroad. It is John Locke who theorized the liberal solution in his treatise on tolerance, published in 1689. Catholics can be tolerated, he's talking of England, if they renounce any political support of the Pope or of any power outside England. This is how Locke formulated the key tenet of the liberal theory of the nation state. The liberal notion of the nation state turned majority and minority into permanent political identities. Only the majority has sovereignty. The minority must not participate in sovereignty. The notion of a sovereign majority alongside non-sovereign minorities was the original sin of liberal political theory. Now, let me explain this majority-minority construct. In democratic theory, majority and minority are not permanent. Majority and minority are the result of a political process, which is the only reason why a minority would pay allegiance to the political process because it has hopes of becoming a majority someday. And a majority can be held accountable in the political process because otherwise it may lose support and become a minority. But in the theory of the nation state, 
the majority and minority are not the result of a political process. They exist prior to the political process. They are permanent majorities and permanent minorities. So my first contention is that the nation state, which has not been a permanent thing, which has been with us roughly 500 years, that the nation state contradicts the key assumptions of democratic theory and practice. Now, in this book, uh, Neither Settler Nor Native, I explore the export of the notion of different kinds of citizens, sovereign and non-sovereign, from the US to South Africa, Nazi Germany, then Israel. Um, a word about sovereign and non-sovereign citizens. Minorities are considered non-sovereign. They have rights, but they're not supposed to participate in power. Power belongs to the majority. Now, Neither Settler Nor Native is a book about the United States as a founding experience in modern colonialism. The first chapter explores the Indian reservation as the site where core institutions of modern colonialism were forged. It is also a book about extreme violence as a consequence of modern nation state building in the post colonies. Should we think of extreme violence as the consequence of a criminal project executed by individuals, no matter how numerous, along lines of the criminal model popularized by Nuremberg and today upheld by the ICC? Or should we think of it as a political project, a notion born of the transition from apartheid in South Africa? What can we learn from the failure of denazification and the relative success of post-apartheid South Africa? In other words, there are two ways of responding to extreme violence. One is to define it as criminal and to look for and identify perpetrators and to punish them as individual perpetrators. Extreme violence is thus understood as a collection of a series of individual crimes. This is the Nuremberg model. This is the model that South Africa threw away when it looked for a different way of understanding extreme violence, not as criminal, but as political. It said, okay, we will take into account that individuals have committed crimes, but the South African problem is more than that. It's a political problem. It's a systemic exclusion of those defined as minorities from the democratic political process. And it requires a political solution. It cannot be solved by putting thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people in jail. It requires a reform of the political system. This is the difference that I want to highlight. I hope to have highlighted in this book. So finally, the book asks, what is transportable in the South African experience? What does South Africa have to teach us? And to answer this question, the last chapter takes a fresh look a look through South African lenses at Israel-Palestine, likely the most intractable political problem in today's world. So let me begin with American Indians and African Americans, two minorities in the US. First, let's begin with definition. How should we call those who lived in the Americas before Columbus? Should we call them as Indians? Columbus's mistake? Or should we call them as native? Native to what? Native to the United States of America? But not really, because they don't belong to the USA. 
and I will explain this. The museum in Washington, DC, there's a museum in Washington, DC dedicated to pre-Columbian civilizations in the Americas. It is not called Museum of the Native American. It's called Museum of the American Indian. Ask yourself why. In 1964, the US passed a Civil Rights Act. This act did not apply to Indians in reservations. In fact, they had to pass a separate act, the Indian Civil Rights Act in 1968. But the two acts are not the same. The 1964 act is constitutionally binding, whereas the 1968 Indian Act is not. It is only advisory. Why? Because reservation Indians are not and never have been rights-bearing citizens of the US in a constitutional sense. There were no reservations before the United States. The reservation was a creation of the US. Though the reservation is geographically within the territory of the US, it is a polity separate from the US. The Europeans who came to America were not immigrants, they were settlers. So what's the difference? Whether they seek equality or advantage, immigrants come to join existing polities. Settlers come to displace existing polities and establish their own exclusive sovereignty. Settlers come to create a settler state. European settlers in the US did not join any of the Indian polities that existed. Their project was to destroy these and displace them by a new polity, a settler state, a white state. The Indian polities had a different status. The Indian, I, I think you can look at Indian history in, in its relations with, uh, with the US as uh, going over two phases. The first phase was uh, literally war and annihilation, uh, degrees of genocide. The second phase uh, coincides with the civil war in the US. And it coincides with the emancipation of slaves, of African slaves. The same person who is credited with the emancipation of slaves, Abraham Lincoln, is the same person who created reservations for Indians, who put Indians behind enclosures. And then a legal system was devised, which would define how these Indians would be governed. Legally, reservation Indians are wards of the US Congress. Reservation authorities are overseen by a vast federal bureaucracy known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This bureau is no different from the colonial bureaucracy that governed any indirect rule colony in Africa, for example. Now, if we want to understand the contemporary significance of this, we should realize that the Indian reservation was part of a two-state solution. The two-state solution is a sovereign state alongside a non-sovereign protectorate. For example, Israel is a sovereign state and the West Bank as a non-sovereign protectorate. Germany also embraced a two-state solution after Nuremberg. Instead of reintegrating Jews as equal citizens in a single state as part of a one-state solution, 
Post-Holocaust Germany embraced the idea of a separate state for Jews. As a result, even if the Nazi project was defeated militarily, it survived politically. The two-state solution gave the Nazi project a longer political lease. The latest version of the two-state solution we are all aware, aware is in Israel-Palestine. In contrast to South Africa, where the population was subordinated, the majority of the population in Israel was expelled outside its boundaries, as it had been in the US when Indians were herded into reservations. America also originated the notion of differentiated citizenship with only some participating in sovereignty. Until 1921, Indians were nationals, but not citizens. After that, Indians had first to be purged as members of Indian polities, the reservations, before they could be naturalized as US citizens. Colonized Indians and African slaves represent two different colonial solutions. Both were turned into minorities, one inside the state, the other outside it. One was sustained by colonial conquest, the other by racial domination. The consequences have been radically different. This is another important point I would like us to focus on from the book. Racial and colonial domination are not the same, even if racial domination is common to both. Reservation Indians have a different relationship to the US from that of African Americans. Colonization refers to conquest of territory. The American Indian symbolized land which has been stolen. The African slave embodied captive and coarse labor. The one state solution provided a political frame for the development of the struggle against Jim Crow and racial domination. Even if it proceeded by fits and starts, even receding at times, the one state framework both underlined the necessity of developing alliances and made it possible. The two state solution explains both the continued isolation of the reservation Indian through colonization and their ongoing fragmentation as a people. Now, here's my main point. African-Americans, even when they had no rights or just nominal rights, were part of the state system we know as the US. As part of that state system, even though there were attempts to isolate them through segregation, they were still able to build alliances within that state system. American Indians were not part of the state system. They were not even part of another state which was cohesive and unified. They were fragmented into 100 plus reservations. They were unable to form alliances, unable to even come together themselves. This has had radically different consequences for the two groups, African-Americans and American Indians. In both cases, numerically, these groups are minorities. African-Americans are 15% roughly of the US population. But if we look at the history, the political history of African-Americans, you will realize that their influence has grown over time. Politically, their influence has grown over time. Their political influence has very little relationship to their numbers. Numerically, they are 15%. But politically today, especially after Black Lives Matter, African-Americans 
have been defining the parameters within which struggles for political reform have been unfolding. You can say they have been providing political leadership within the US. American Indians have been fragmented, marginalized, with the highest rates of suicide, unemployment within North America, lives of despair, little to look forward to. You can see the consequences of, on the one hand, a one-state solution. On the other hand, a two-state or a multiple-state solution. This two-state solution explains both the continued isolation of the reservation Indian through colonization and their ongoing fragmentation as a people. The American model was exported to a number of places, amongst these South Africa, Germany and Israel. Let me go to South Africa. South African settlers attained state independence in 1910. Settlers became independent of Britain. A delegation visited North America, USA and Canada two years later to study how Indians were governed. Three key elements of governance were imported to South Africa, homeland, traditional authority, and customary law. The starting fiction was that, well, the colonized population, the African population was divided into tribes. I was asking uh, Professor Kaka earlier as to what do Indian scholars mean by tribes? I think the original meaning definition of tribes comes from the American colonization of Indians. It turns a cultural set of practices, a cultural identity into a political administrative project. The starting fiction was that every tribe has from time immemorial lived in a territorially contained homeland. The fiction of a homeland in reality masked a program to expel each tribe from the bulk of its historical lands. We all know, even though in, in India there's a controversy about who came first, <clears throat> the quote tribals or the quote Aryans. But anybody who studies global history knows that humanity began in Africa, not in India or anywhere else. We also know that Africans with low density of population at that early time adopted modes of livelihood which were not settled they combined settlements with movement. They moved over places. There was no such thing as a homeland. The homeland is the creation of a settler designed to limit the colonized native to a small part of the lands they would have walked through raised over before colonization. So the first um, <clears throat> invention was this notion of a homeland. The second invention was the notion of a traditional authority. Again said to have been traditional from time immemorial, eternally sanctioned by custom, never to be elected, always to be customary. 
And third, this traditional authority claimed the right to enforce a customary law on the homeland. And this custom too was said to have been there from time immemorial. This time though, settlers insisted that custom be excised of all practices or notions that settlers considered repugnant to civilization. In India, the notion of custom becomes a powerful colonial assertion after the 1857 war of independence or uprising, however you term it. If you've read Henry Maine in Ancient Law, you will realize that Maine was in search of a legitimizing political practice which would strengthen colonial power. Maine understood that the British by themselves could not rule India on their own. And that the only option for the British was to look for Indian sources, Indian institutions, and Indian practices that could be married to colonial rule. And in the course of doing so, they looked for the weakest section of Indian society and turned those into traditional authorities, gave them the right both to define genuine custom and to interpret it. Define the custom as religious. After 1857, Queen Victoria issued a proclamation and the proclamation said that Britain will not interfere in Indian custom, particularly Indian religion. It will leave it to Indians themselves these were highfalutin words. But behind it lay a project. Who was to define? Who were the Indians with the right and authority to define and interpret custom? Who was to decide that custom had to be religious? Who was to decide that this religious custom had to be like a pledge of loyalty? You could only hold one passport. Who was to decide that custom could never be multiple? Customary authority. And who was to decide who was the legitimate customary authority? The colonial power. I'm digressing. And <clears throat> Professor Kaka, you will guide me. Uh, yeah. Whether... Uh, yeah, we we are have time, sir. Yeah. yeah. We have okay. about uh, 15, 20 minutes we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm going to skip over. I have a chapter on Germany. The book is available. Those interested can, can, uh, can get the book from the library even. I hope the library gets books. So I'm going to skip over two sections, uh, Germany and uh, South Sudan. And I come to Israel and the US. Are Jewish people in Israel settlers or immigrants? The Jewish population of Mandate Palestine belonged to three groups. First were those who had never left Palestine. They were among the natives of Palestine. Second were those who returned to the Holy Land on a pilgrimage, seeking a religious homeland. They were content to be part of the existing polity. This group in Jewish and Israeli history is, is known as the first Aliyah, 
They were immigrants. But then followed others, the second and the third aliyahs. They looked to create their own exclusive polity, a Jewish state in place of the existing policy. These were the settlers. The settlers have a political project, and that is what distinguishes them from immigrants. Immigrants may come to make money, to feel at home in a, in a cultural space, but settlers have a political project. The Zionist drew a lesson from Germany. Victims of the nation state project in Germany and in Europe, Zionists decided to set up a nation state in Eretz Israel. The Zionist state project unfolded in two phases. The first reduced Palestinians from a majority to a minority. The catastrophic expulsion is known as the Nakba. The Zionist project has continued to demonize the minority that remained within its territorial boundaries as a demographic threat whose numbers must be cut down, which is why they say the Nakba continues. Palestinians inside Israel do not participate in sovereignty. They have rights, even political rights, including the right to vote, but they do not participate in power. This vision has become clearer as the state project has been redefined. From Israel as a Jewish and democratic state to Israel as a Jewish state. I don't know if you have been keeping up with what's been going on inside Israel now. Almost like a civil war uh, amongst the Jews uh, with uh, Palestinians bystanders watching from the sidelines. Um, and there you have a clear definition of who decides what is the nature of the, this state. Uh, for the moment, at least, the contest is limited to Jewish Israelis. So in this context, Palestinians face two options. A one-state solution where they would face racial exclusion, including political marginalization, but within the same state. In contrast, the two-state solution would create a protectorate and lead to indirect colonialism under Zionist rule. In my book, I argue that a one-state solution will provide a better framework for building alliances for a durable resistance. You can see in the present situation in Israel that the presumed unity of the Jewish people no longer holds. The options for liberal Jews and for Palestinians of possible alliances along defined common interests, those options are growing. But I argue that resistance is not enough. One also needs the vision of a different future. And I propose that we look at the South African transition from apartheid for a glimpse of a third alternative. If you look at South African politics, I suggest uh, that the that the dividing line is in the 1970s. Before the 70s, anti-apartheid politics was largely derivative. It uncritically embraced the architecture of apartheid. The resistance to apartheid reproduced the architecture of apartheid. How? Because even in the resistance, each racial group organized separately as defined by apartheid power. The ANC organized Africans. The Indian Congress of Natal under Gandhi organized Indians. Colored People's Congress organized coloreds. And the Congress of Democrats organized whites. They couldn't call themselves Congress of Whites. Apartheid's ideological hold was not broken until the 1970s. The key initiative came from the student movement, white and black. The strong point was after black students under Steve Biko left the liberal white student organization, formed their own separate body and went on to organize township dwellers, starting with Soweto. 
Radical white students left in the wilderness turned to organizing hostel workers on the fringes of these same townships. The turning point in anti-apartheid politics was not the armed struggle, but the strikes that began in Durban in 1973 and the uprising in Soweto in 1976. The Soweto uprising unfolded under the banner Black Consciousness. Biko said, Black is not a color. Black is an experience. If you are oppressed, you are Black. The important thing is to recognize that there was nothing inevitable about the impact of Black consciousness on the anti-apartheid struggle. BC, Black consciousness, could have led to a nation state consciousness claiming that South Africa is a Black nation of the Black majority of the indigenous people, thus essentializing Black as a trans-historical identity. Instead, it led to an epistemological awakening, the consciousness of Black as a historical political identity. Afrikaners made a journey from being junior partners of British colonialism to being part of the anti-apartheid coalition. How was this possible? There was no consensus inside the Afrikaners. The rift inside the Afrikaner community was demonstrated by the publication of a book authored by Rian Malan, the great grandson of a Boer state president. The book was called My Traitor's Heart. Malan was a crime reporter for the Johannesburg Star. His beat covered black townships. Each chapter of his book focused on a specific type of what was then called black on black pilots. One chapter was devoted to the hammer man, a big black man who wielded a heavy hammer to smash the skull of his victims. All equally black, but poor people who would yield small pittances. Malan's subtext was not difficult to decipher. If they can do this to their own, what will they do to us if given half a chance? The South African moment was born in the 70s and 80s. This birth was marked by a threefold shift in vision. From opposition to apartheid, they looked for an alternative to apartheid. Rather than being content with turning the world upside down, they dared to think of a different world. Big, big change. From a state of the majority, the national majority, the black majority, the resistance began looking to create a state of all the people. From opposition to whites, the resistance went on to oppose white power. I suggest we think of this seminal significance of these three shifts. I suggest we think of 1994 as marking the birth of a new political community. The alternative would have been to rupture the existing community into two separate ones. One for blacks, the other for whites, requiring a partition of South Africa. Let us not forget that in 1994, Afrikaners were divided about the future. A minority were asking for a homeland where Afrikaners would have their own state. The anti-apartheid movement chose a different future, a common future for survivors of apartheid, who have often described, who have often been described as a rainbow. Not just victims who survived, but all who survived, whether victims in perpetrators, beneficiaries, or bystanders. One of my key conclusions is that is to beware of transporting human rights discourse, which is about individual rights and individual crimes into the political domain. Because when mass violence, extreme violence goes beyond individuals and targets entire communities, then we have to think of a way forward to which political reform has to be central. 
in which minority and majority are rethought. Not by denying that there are cultural differences, but by depoliticizing cultural differences. By making sure that the political process is as inclusive as possible. And this is probably the most controversial part of the book, because I argue that to do so, we have to bring everybody at the table. To make sure that justice doesn't turn into revenge, we have to bring victims, perpetrators, beneficiaries, bystanders, everybody to the table, which is what South Africa did at the Kempton Park negotiations. Of course, there's a downside to what happened in 1994 in South Africa. There was no social justice. There was political justice. In other words, that the political system was expanded. Everybody became a citizen of South Africa with political rights, but it did not translate into social justice, into economic justice. The struggle for that continues. The only good thing about it is that the struggle for social justice is not between races. But along lines which divide class from class and because class still to a significant extent coincides with race, also race from race. Last struggle and racial struggle crisscross. I'm going to stop there um, and, and leave uh, room for, for questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Mandani, for that really erudite and it's 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 a breathtaking uh, lecture. I think it's and it is probably one of the most beautiful lectures I've heard because you covered such a vast pan panorama of of issues, topics. Uh, so um, at this stage, I invite people to uh, fill in the chat box with their questions. If they have any questions, they can please uh, please feel free to uh, to. Uh, add them add, add them in the in the chat box if if you would like to ask professor Mamdani a question directly you may raise your hand we will un unmute you and you can ask a question um as and when uh, so as and when people are filling in the the chat box i i have some questions of my own um so we, maybe we can begin with the discussion and then allow the questions to come in uh, you know, you began your your talk with the two state solution. Um, you know, uh, you sorry, you 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 began the the your your talk with the idea that how in Spain, um, uh, in 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 Iberia in fourteen ninety two, it is that is the genesis of what we call as a one country one people project, um, and the same thing that. Uh, when it was applied to multiple parts of of the world, how how have the ramifications actually played played out? Um, and then uh, perhaps one of the most striking examples from your talk is the two state solution, and it is often a binary approach within the political discourse that we see that both the settlers and uh, quote unquote settlers quote unquote natives have to engage with. So my question to you is. You know, uh, you've proposed a one-state solution to sort of address uh, this this conundrum. But how easy or 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 how how difficult do you think this transition actually is? Because this is, this is a political project that has been ongoing for the last say seven hundred years. So in order to dismantle this project, what are the challenges that you foresee? going forward in a in in the contemporary time 
<laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, this uh, should have been this should be... not not the first not the um, but but I will uh, I will I will I will uh, give you my thoughts on it. Um, look like any uh, like any poor uh, issue. Uh, there is no quick fix. Um, one has to begin with the understanding that uh, whatever we give the dignity of the term solution is going to be arrived over time through political practice, through the participation of larger and larger numbers of people in the political domain, through learning of lessons, through shedding of illusions, through even redefining the project. And that this is going to be different in different parts of the world because each political trajectory will have been defined by a particular history. So, although my book is not about India, but let me just give you a reference point. The, 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 um, the struggle for independence in India turned out to be at the same time a struggle for what was called self-determination. And part of the struggle for self-determination was what was called the two-nation theory. That India had two nations. One Muslim, the other Hindu. Of course, key, key to the nation state project is the idea that you can map a nation, a cultural construct to a territory, a state construct. Because if the cultural population does not have a territorial integrity, if it is spread all over the place, the determination of the cultural self cannot be equated with the determination of a territory. So in this first phase in India, with the assumption that self-determination with the determination of two religious groups each mapped on to a particular territory, you had bizarre outcomes. The majority of Muslims were left in India. What the Sikhs may have regard regarded as their historical homelands were left in Pakistan. If you look at it from a historical vantage point, the greatest victims of the partition were the Muslims left in India. It's becoming clear. The second greatest victims were the Muslims left in Pakistan because 
they were subject to the state deciding who is a genuine Muslim and who is not. Shias are not genuine Muslims. Ahmadiyyas are not genuine Muslims. And the third victims are likely to be Hindus in India because that question is bound to be raised. Who is a genuine Hindu? Who is not? In Israel, even after 70 or so years, there is no agreement on who is a Jew. Even the state has two definitions of who is a Jew. The first definition in the law of return is a broad definition of a Jew. The second definition in the halacha law, which is the Jewish customary law, is a very narrow definition. Which is why so many Jews who are not Orthodox, if they want to get married, they leave Israel. And they get married by civil law outside and then return to Israel. So what I'm saying is, How do we link culture to territory? How do we link territory to politics? Look, the nation state project resulted in this incredible uh, mass bloodletting, 100 years war known in Europe. In the US, it led to the Civil War because the Confederacy was basically a claim that each state in Europe, in, 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 in the US, was like a state in Europe. The, after the Civil War, you had the creation of a of an American citizenship. You could be born in any state in the US and you could move to any other state from Alabama to California and have the same rights as somebody born in California. The federal solution has been most prominent in settler states because the settlers came from different histories. And it was a peacekeeping device. It was a way to moderate the nation state project as much as possible. But it's been undone by war mainly because the states don't have a right over the use of force. Not even the central government, not even Congress in the US, but it's the president. Anyway, I've, I've uh, yeah. moved away from your question. But no, I think it was, so uh, maybe Devoshmita can um, take up the questions in the, in the chat box. Yeah, so there are, I think, three, uh, three questions so far. Uh, one, is from uh, Venkatesh who's asking, what are your views on the refugee minorities? There is Anjum Afros who's asking, can you please reflect on solution for the making of my, my, uh, permanent minority in India in recent decade? Uh, there's another question. So, uh, Devashmita, we can, we can yeah. maybe first take the, uh, the, the first two questions and then we can go, go to the next question. Yeah. Okay. Look, um, when 
when the banner of citizenship and rights of citizenship was raised in the French Revolution. This was taken to be a great step forward, a, a, a step that empowered people outside of the power with the dignity of citizenship and the rights of citizenship. In the First World War, after the First World War, Europeans wanted to add to this with rights of minorities. But after the Holocaust and the murder of minorities, Europeans then moved to individual rights. But still, what it didn't cover were refugees. Still limited to citizenship. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is that citizenship, which the French Revolution was an empowering development, is now rapidly becoming a disempowering development. I'll give you the example of South Africa. In 1994, when the first post-apartheid election was held in South Africa, the big question was, who can vote? Now, this was a potent question in South Africa because of two reasons. One, there were millions of migrant workers in South Africa from all around Southern Africa from Zimbabwe, from Mozambique, from Malawi, lots of places. Not only that, they had been at the forefront of the trade union organization for starting with Fosatu in the 1970s. So they were mobilized and their influence was greater than their numbers. So the big question was, can they vote? Because they are migrants, similar to refugees, right? They've just come, their home is elsewhere. So there were two views. One was only citizens should be able to vote and the other was all residents should be able to vote. If the state claims the right to tax a resident, then the reciprocal demand should be the right to vote. And all other political rights that go with it. In South Africa, the position that all residents should have the same rights, won out. But then in the new coalition government, the new Minister of Internal Affairs, Home Affairs, was Gat Shabutelezi, the Inkatha party president. From the day he took office, he began to issue one after another administrative decree, widening the difference, the split between citizen and refugee. You can trace the effects to what is called xenophobic violence, which is not violence of indigenous groups against settlers or previous pre-existing settlers or whites, but it is violence against those who came in from across the border, against other black people. 
Mind you that when the ANC was formed and when it issued the Freedom Charter in 1955, a key provision in the Freedom Charter was South Africa belongs to all those who live in it. Didn't say South Africa belongs to its citizens, no. So if human right is to have any meaning, it has to be preceded by an acceptance that all who live on the land should have the same rights to the land. Um, thank you, Professor Mandani. Um, Professor Ranujan has a question, so I request her to kindly ask the question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mamdani, for giving me giving such an interesting lecture. Can you all hear me, or is my voice echoing? Yes. Yes, yes, it is. It is clear. Okay. Uh, Professor Mamdani, I'm looking at the concept of modernity from the Indian perspective, where there is no homogeneous concept of minority. There is no simple power equation. The intra-community and inter-community uh, uh, problems, factions, fragmentation, where we cannot say that because a particular group is a minority group, this kind of behavior can be predicted from it. This kind of treatment they will get from the society, wider society, where you, your concept of sovereignty itself stands challenged, especially when we look at majority community vis-a-vis -vis Dalits. I mean, uh, do you think that the concept of minority has any analytical value anymore? Should we search for some other concept which will be able to help us in understanding what we want to communicate by a particular concept, like tribal, like religious community? I'm really not understanding it. I can't hear you. Professor Mamdani, you have to un, un, unmute yourself. Um, yeah. Can you? Yes, okay. yes. So, um, You know, Chair, I was hoping that you would ask someone to ask me a question in Gujarati. <laughs> I never had a chance to respond in Gujarati in a public forum. I, I really hope someone does because I, yeah, I we have enough so. students in there. Yeah. Yes. But now to respond to Professor Ramchand. Uh, Professor Ramchand, I'm not very sympathetic to your question. I'll tell you why because I think you're trying to run away from the problem by pleading that you want theoretical elegance. You're trying to run away from the, uh, the, the, from dirtying your hands. I'll give you an example. If you take the Puna, in Gujarati Puna, right? Um, confrontation between Gandhi and Ambedkar. Ambedkar wanted a Muslim solution for Dalits. The Muslim solution would be reserved seats for Dalits, a separate electorate, and Ambedkar was saying, if this is okay for Muslims, why not for the Dalits? Gandhi's response was, sure, it's okay for Muslims, but not for the Dalits. Why? Because Muslims are a minority, the Dalits are not. Why not? because Dalits are Hindus. 
And as Hindus, they are part of the majority. Muslims are not Hindus. In that debate, the definition of a minority was a non-Hindu, not necessarily a Muslim, but a non-Hindu. This is before Pakistan. This is before the Indian constitution. In my view, this problem is not the result of partition. Partition is the outcome of this problem. So I think we have to work through the political muddle. We have to work through the presumption. India has hundreds of minorities, but political minority is religious. So how does one deal with this? This is a real challenge. Thank you. So uh, we can take one final question. Um, it's from Afif Ahmed. He says that, uh, thank you for your detailed lecture. Uh, his question is, how do you view the moral critiques towards the project of modernity, which the likes of Taral Assad and Wael Halak proposes? Also in the context of a series of, of the Arab Springs, we could see the transformation of subjects from a military to uh, from a military to a political struggle was only partially fulfilled. And states like Egypt and Tunisia still suffer from the larger in instabilities created by the spring. How can we account for this inability to transform societies in such contexts? Well, um, I have a lot of sympathy for Dalal's critique of modernity. Um, central to political modernity is the nation state project. And, and my argument is that that project needs reforming. That's the argument I presented today. The Arab Spring I mean in Egypt the Arab Spring died the day its social base split between the Muslim brothers and the left the left was The left was scared. What happens if the Muslim brothers are returned to power in the next election? And they start implementing a social project, an anti-secular social project. This was, this was the big scare. And the left, in fact, joined the military. That million youth march paved the way for the military to come to power. And its first act when coming to power was to butcher the Muslim brothers. From that point on, the Arab Spring stopped being an anti-authoritarian political project, it became a civil war between Islamists and secularists. Never mind that the Muslim brothers, because the Islamists were divided into two, one Islamist group was wedded to armed struggle. Muslim brothers were not. Muslim brothers were wedded to 
a political struggle, an electoral struggle, fighting elections or competing in elections. But once the target of the Arab Spring shifted, well, only the name remained the same. Now, if, we, if I just take a few more minutes to look at the present situation, because right now what you're getting is kind of an Arab Spring from above. You, you have got this peace deal signed between Iran and Saudi Arabia, brokered by the Chinese. Nobody knows what the outcome of this is going to be. It appears to have a more profound, it is likely to have a more profound outcome then the Arab Spring, which began as a society against the state struggle and degenerated into a civil war in society. Today, if you want to look at a civil war in society, it's inside Israel. Jewish citizens of Israel split between religious and secular. Israel is becoming a Middle Eastern country. The religious groups are in the majority. They have popular support and they want to assert it through the supremacy of parliament. They want the courts to be, they want to do away with the supremacy of the courts courts must ensure that parliament is supreme. They've got 30 legislative bills now waiting to be passed, at the end of which there will be no rights, either of minorities or individuals. Now, this civil war inside Israel, most of the military, the, the military leadership, most of the Air Force are saying, we will not obey orders. In the present situation, Israel cannot go to war because its war machine is split. And if it cannot go to war, it is useless for the US. We don't know. We don't know what's around the corner. We don't know whether the Iran-Arabia pact will last more than a few weeks. It may not, but it may. Um, so I think I think we are at a point where we need to rethink a lot, um, and and a part of this lot. To go back to your opening sentence, critiques of modernity, is this question of secularism. And. I think that's the significance of Dalal Asad's book, Formations of the Secular, even though he does not spell it out fully, but he's opened the discussion. Thank you, sir. So uh, just as a closing note there, there's two questions I would like to merge and then maybe we can end, end it for, for today. Uh, one is the... Uh, uh, if you can reflect on making on the making of a permanent minority in India in recent decades, and the second is, what are your thoughts on the Sri Lankan Tamils? So you can choose to answer. <laughs> oh, my friend, <laughs> Professor Kaka, I, I mean, 
I have made no claim that I can answer anything that yes. in mind because yes. I'm sure there's much on your mind. Yes, um, yes, yes. So, so, so uh, no, so on that, I think because we have all, we have also um, uh, crossed the time limit. So I think yeah. uh, we can end it on that. Yeah, uh, Look, we can. My book is not on India and it's not on Sri Lanka. Yes. So it's no, 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 that's true. So we have no. So we we have. Uh, so just as a general note to the audience, that we we did, we are sticking to what the book actually discusses, rather than uh, the outside domains of of uh, what's what's I mean, happening. I would, have, I would have loved to have listened to a discussion on this amongst you. True, uh, true. The making. So maybe of, you know. I'll just say one thing about permanent man. You, you see. My, my family, ancestrally, came from Kathiawar, right? From around Jamnagar. Um, and uh, amongst the, I, I, I belong to this group known as the Koja group. And the Kojas converted, right? And in their conversion, they changed their first name. They didn't change their last name. In India, one of the important issues least researched is the question of conversion. I would bet that close to 95% of Muslims in India are converts. They didn't come from anywhere. They became Muslims where they were. They converted. But the definition of the Muslim minority is overdetermined by not Muslims, but Turkish <clears throat> invaders from the outside. Um, yes. It's very similar. At one level, it's similar to China. Because these invaders, whether Delhi Sultanate, Mongols, and then and then and then the no, Mo Mughals, Delhi Sultanate, Mughals, and and in China the Mongols. Both the Indian state and the Chinese state, the modern Indian state and the modern Chinese state, have their origins in minorities which came in and established power. The results have been very different. In China, the Mongol minority, the first of the rulers changed his name to, I think, Zhuang De. Zhuang, I don't speak Chinese, so um, it's a it's a it's a it's a fascinating topic. How the results in India would turn out to be so different, with a politics revolving around the minority question. Well, not quite true. In, in in China, actually, the whole of Asia, this minority majority is a burning question. It's not religious everywhere. In China, the Uyghurs and the Tibetans. In India, the Muslims. In Pakistan, the Shias. In Iran, the Sunnis. In Turkey, so on and so forth. The whole of Asia, minority majority is a burning issue. So I think we, while we 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 focus on the particularity of each Sri Lanka Tamils, particularity of each issue, we also do not forget that there is something shared between these different particularities. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Professor Mamdani. I think uh, I, uh, maybe from my side, I can I can promise you that once you once you come to India next, we will we we will invite you to Gujarat and we will have a larger Gujarati audience for you to in interact with. Thank you so much, and we hope to meet you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you.